Hello. Moving from point A to point B is changing rapidly as people are increasingly choosing to ride an e-scooter instead of taking a more traditional way of commuting. In this session, we are discussing the highly competitive market of micro-mobility with Voi, one of the European giants of the industry. I'm Santeri Toivonen, Chief Marketing Officer of Slush, and today we have the co-founder and CEO, Frederik Helm, and VP of Crowd, Karo Helm, here to discuss how Voi has successfully scaled their business in the competitive micro-mobility uh, industry. Frederik, um, let's start from the origin story of Voi. When you founded Voi in 2018, what, wa what was the problem you wanted to solve? Uh, yeah, thank you, Santeri. Really great to be here. It's my third slash now, um, yeah, being here in person, and it's getting better every every year. Uh, so super happy to be here, and great to have you on stage as well. Um, and uh, uh, conscious of that, this is the this is the last session of the day, and we've spent eight nine hours here in the yeah, dark nightclub that slash um, uh, that slash looks like to some extent. Yeah, we'll try to keep the energy level high. Um, and back to your question. So um, I was the founder of Voy, and also. Uh, uh, one of the co-founders of Voy, and I'm still the CEO of the company. Uh, what we saw back then uh, was uh, uh, really a problem in cities. So what we saw was that way too many short car and uh, uh, that there were way too many short car and taxi trips done in cities every day. And uh, what we also saw was that cities got more congested, more polluted, even though uh, when we talked to cities, yeah, we heard the same. Yeah, we want to move towards a kind of less congested, less, uh, less polluted future, more sustainable mobility, more electrified mobility, lighter vehicles in the, uh, in the cities, in the streets, less space for cars and heavy vehicles, more space for pedestrians, for people on bikes, for people on e-bikes, for people on e-scooters. Mm. And that was really the, yeah, the problem we saw back then, that we need to change how people move around in cities. We need to move away from heavy combustion engine vehicles to light vehicles, light electric vehicles. And we started with um, um, yeah, Shad electric scooters in Stockholm uh, back in 2018, the summer of 2018. And since then, we have scaled our services, both the, the on-demand Shad electric scooters, mm. also long-term rental electric scooters in certain cities, so you can have your own VOI. Um, E-bikes uh, in several countries in Europe, a resale program where we, uh, after a couple of years, when we see that the, um, yeah, that the vehicles, yeah, what we see now is that the vehicles last uh, so much longer than what they did back in the days. Mm. We see that they last longer now that they, than they are competitive. So then we refurbish the vehicles after a couple of years and resell them uh, on the second-hand market. So that's some of the things we're doing now. Uh, we have done more than 80 million trips. Uh, in Europe uh, throughout the last uh, couple of years, wow. um, and we're more excited than ever. As I see it, we're, yeah, if this would have been a football game, we're in minute nine of a 90-minute football game. So, so much, uh, yeah, so much uh, more goals to make and so much more time to play on. Mm -hmm. So, great to be here. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Caro, I have read that um, micro-mobility will kill the car. Mm. What do you think about this? Oh, that's a very good question. I think, um, as Fredrik is talking about a little bit, I mean, Voy was founded with the vision to create cities that are more adapted to the people that live there with less space for cars. Mm. And I think it's quite evident to everyone that change is needed when it comes to transport, especially in the city centers, uh, where we're seeing, you know, 25%, 30% of the carbon emissions come from transport. Mm. Um, that micromobility can be a part of solving that problem. I think us at Voy, we still believe that the public transportation will be the backbone of any urban transport, but that needs to be combined with light electric or non-electric vehicles mm. uh, through micromobility hubs. And I think we will definitely in the future see cities with 
less space for cars and more space and better infrastructure for micromobility. Um, I think it's absolutely absurd, to be honest, that still 50% of the space in many city centers across cities in Europe is dedicated to big metal boxes that spit out poisonous gas. And that's where we're living and where more and more people also want to live. Uh, and if more people are moving into the cities, we won't have space for those big, inefficient, which they are, mm. type of vehicles. However, like I don't believe that uh, micromobility will kill the car because the car will still be necessary. I just think that we will have smarter, more shared solutions and in the end, like more space for people and less space for cars. Makes sense. That was a wonderful uh, answer. But uh, we came here to talk about, talk about scaling and I have three main areas that I want to focus on today. And these are different markets and their cultures, marketing, of course, and product. But before we jump on a specific topic, um, I still want to understand how you approach growth. And, and Karo, um, when did you like, realize that you need to expand from Sweden? Good question. Um, so uh, when um, when we started Boy, uh, uh, by the way, I am uh, I'm the first employee of Boy, so I've been with the company since the start. Um, and when we started Boy, uh, we knew uh, from the start that we wanted to be part of making a big change, right? We wanted to really, and we've had the same with, uh, vision since we launched the company, uh, a vision of creating better cities for people with less noise, pollution, congestion. And in order to do that, we need to think in, or we needed to think in a big way from the start. Uh, because in order to make like a proper change, um, we couldn't just stick in Sweden. Uh, also being from a small country, Sweden, or uh, similar to Finland, yes. uh, the home market is good, but it's not big enough if you want to build something huge. So even before we launched our first like 16 e-scooters in the streets of Stockholm back in 2018, we knew that we wanted to take the company um, to at least a European level. And since then, we have scaled from yeah those 16 e-scooters in Stockholm to uh, now over 70 cities in uh, yeah all across Europe, which is amazing. And um, four cities here in Finland, uh, which is one of our best performing markets. So it's uh, it's really great to be here. All right, but like, what type of signals are you looking for when you when you like scan the whole Europe or whole the world? Like, um, how do you decide where you go, Frederick? Yeah, no, great question. And I think what Caroline mentioned there is uh, is extremely important. I think one key to success for many Nordic companies, that we come from small domestic markets, and if we want to build big companies, we have to go at least European or yeah, outside of our home markets and preferably international. You see that in many other Nordic companies, some of the big success stories, yeah, including the one from Sweden, Spotify, Klarna, King and so on. And we had that belief from day one uh, that yeah, we're in transportation and we're in mass market transportation. We want to democratize micromobility. Yeah, first do a million trips, then do a billion trips, then reach a billion users to really have the impact and change that Caroline is talking about. So already before we launched in uh, Stockholm, the summer of 2018, um, we had an idea of let's move as fast as possible out in other European markets as well. And I, I back then uh, uh, thought, uh, can, how, yeah, how do we understand which markets are attractive and not? So I called a friend uh, who was at McKinsey, mm. uh, the strategy consultancy, yes. who are famous for uh, doing this market attractiveness analysis and uh, hired him over the summer. And yeah, we were a very young startup and I was like, yeah, we even get the person from McKinsey to, uh, to help Amazing. us out. Yeah. And uh, um, so we, he and some others, they traveled around Europe, they built this model for market attractiveness. And we started in Stockholm. And if you think of Stockholm, it's quite similar to Helsinki today, at least in the winters. It's cold, it's dark, and so on. So people told us like, micromobility, shared e-scooters, shared e-bikes will never work in Stockholm. It's too cold, people will never use it, you won't get the economics to work. Uh, so uh, we did that market attractiveness model um, and realized that Spain, Spain is the future, we need mm. to go to Spain. Uh, it's sunny, some cities have quite good infrastructure for bikes and so on. Um, a lot of tourists that uh, want to use our uh, e-scooters and e-bikes um, uh, eventually. So 
five, six weeks after we launched uh, in Stockholm in Sweden, we went to Madrid. Oh. Uh, we launched in Madrid. Um, I went down, the full team went down to launch the service in Madrid, uh, but we quickly realized that uh, Spain was something completely different than what we had thought and what we had modeled out in our market attractiveness model. Yeah. So nine, ten months later, we had to leave Spain. Uh, <laughs> so it didn't work out at all in Spain. Regulations were not in place. Our product was not good enough. The Spanish market was much tougher when it comes to kind of misbehavior and so on compared to the Nordic markets. Uh, so uh, since then, we have continuously yeah, tweaked and adjusted our our market attract in this model, and we're still learning. Um, and another interesting thing on that one is that, yes, we left Spain um, after less than a year, mm. after having launched the market. One year ago, uh, we came back to Spain, mm. and now Spain is one of our best markets. Mm. So it just shows that uh, uh, even, if, even if it didn't work back then, with improved regulations, with improved product and so on, um, a market can change, dynamics can change and so on. So everything is very much about you know, product, market, team, timing, fit. Mm. We have learned that many times uh, uh, throughout these years. Yeah. And I think that's, uh, to build on that, I think uh, that's what we have done really well as well. Uh, we have uh, dared to take a lot of risk since the start. And uh, with risk, there's either like uh, reward or fail. And uh, as Fredrik mentions, we have since the start had this urge of moving really, really fast and always wanting to move faster than competition, uh, scale faster than competition and gain more market share. And, having taken those risks early on and failed or getting rewarded quite fast, I think that has been one of the things that's made the success of Boy really, because we have, we have really dared to challenge um, status quo and also like broken new ground because uh, e-scooters was, uh, and micromobility was a quite like new industry when we started back in two, uh, 2018. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah. I mean, I think that's really been the part of this, the success. Yeah, and um, yeah, 2018, 2021, now the best performing market, um, one of the best performing markets. Um, but like, what are the biggest cultural learnings that you have learned during the, these three years, like in cultural perspective, like um, Sweden and Spain? They are quite different. Like, are there any like patterns you have found, like how to enter a new new country or market? You mean when it comes to scaling the business, going to new cities, new markets, and so on? Yeah, yeah. especially from the like cultural perspective, like how to communicate with the, like the cities and and the officials and so on. A great question. I think yeah, a, a few things uh, uh, come to mind. One is if you want to move fast in an industry like ours, where you have on the ground the operations. Of, I would say it goes for all industries, but especially if you have a business model like ours or food delivery or grocery delivery, where you have a very local, uh, um, local presence with um, yeah, people on the ground and so on. Uh, you need to be hyper-local to win the market. The only way that I've seen working is, if you want to move fast, is to decentralize, um, yeah, decentralize responsibility, decentralize uh, and delegate to excellent country managers, to excellent city managers, to excellent market operations managers, and have them make decisions and yeah, kind of give them full, um, a full mandate also to make those decisions. Um, I think it's impossible to scale a business like ours, or pretty much any business, if you keep it uh, yeah, if you want to keep very, very centralized control. If mm. I need to be involved in the, in the decisions we're making in Milan or Madrid or Berlin every day, we just become too slow. Mm. Uh, so that's, um, um, yeah, that's one thing I would say. Um, yeah, the, uh, yeah, the, the second thing is also um, um, kind of re really around um, um, yeah, uh, yeah, moving fast that Caroline is talking about. Uh, if you want to scale a business like ours, uh, where several companies were popping up at pretty much the same time, it was a lot of white space out there in Europe, you have to move fast, you have to be fine with moving uncomfortably fast. Mm. There is the saying that if, yeah, if you're not embarrassed about the product you're shipping, you're shipping it too late. And I think that's especially important in very competitive markets. If you're operating in less competitive markets, then you can allow yourself, and, uh, um, yeah, you can allow yourself to take some more time to perfect the product. But in a competitive market, you need to move extremely fast, get the data from the users, get the data from other stakeholders, and then just tweak and iterate. Hmm. Our first scooters were crap. <laughs> I mean, not crap, but they were 
crap compared to the ones that we have today. Yeah. And I think what we did really well there was, again, we put the product out in the street and then we let the users tell us how to improve it. And uh, that is key if you want to go from like nothing to a successful startup to then eventually a scale up and beyond. Yeah, okay. So you told us that the pros were crap. Uh, we can now move to like measuring because uh, we don't want to make um, crappy products. So you're the VP of growth now, and um, of course, when you want to measure the success of growth and marketing, uh, what are the like main KPIs you are now following when you enter new markets, and and uh, how do you distinguish if you are doing crappy uh, business or not? <laughs> <laughs> Good question. Uh, I mean, uh, I think uh, it it goes back to speed uh, for us. Uh, when we launch a new market, it's uh, crucial for us that we quickly scale uh, to uh, you know certain levels of user acquisition. And for me, leading uh, marketing at at Voy, uh, that means like getting to certain thresholds in terms of how many users we acquire, and then how quickly we can get them to um, like through the onboarding, mm. adding payment method, uh, getting on their first e-scooter ride uh, to their third ride and then beyond. Um, so those are the things that we're looking at and uh, we look at those uh, KPIs in a quite like short time frame um, and if we can't reach a certain goal within the time frame, we need to make changes and we need to optimize the way that we communicate our users or the products that we push to them. And uh, I think it goes back to what Fred was talking about with having like flexible and highly uh, local teams that can make their own deci uh, decisions mm. because uh, what we see is that um, some types of communication or some types of marketing activities work really well for some markets uh, but you know something that works in Sweden or in Stockholm doesn't necessarily work in Helsinki mm. um, so we have a playbook that we launch with, but then as, as we see if things are working or not, we need to tweak it depending on the city and the market dynamics. Yeah. yeah. So basically you have like uh, personalized things uh, in different markets, like you, you do things differently, different kind of messages, for example, in Finland and Spain. Yes, exactly. So uh, in, uh, in all the markets where we operate, we have uh, local marketing managers that uh, works with finding local insight, uh, finding local partners, and really localizing the content or the activities that we create centrally. So we have a central marketing and growth team that builds product, that uh, builds uh, um, you know, automation and scalable solutions and tools. Mm. But then the local markets take that, adapt it, optimize it to make sure that we can talk to the customers in a relevant way at a relevant time for them. Uh, I think one really, um, one really good example is that we launched this big campaign where we were pushing our subscription model. Yeah. And uh, in Sweden, it worked really well to push it during mornings between 8 and 10. Because that's when like people get to work, they could get a pass, and then like start commuting with Voy. But it didn't work at all when we looked at the southern European markets. Uh, and then we realized that it worked really well if we pushed the mes uh, message from 10 to 12, because that's when most people go to work in those markets, yeah. uh, or when they look at their phone, or when they're most like open to getting those sort of messages. So. Yeah, taking, taking um, learnings from central uh, automation, scalable solutions, but then adapting them according to local insights. And that's, that really makes sense. Um, we really need to focus on product now. We are running out of time. Um, Frederick, um, how do you ensure that you create a holistically good uh, product experience? You have the like uh, vehicle, and then you have the app, and something is happening between them like can you walk us through like how do you create the perfect product yeah and i wouldn't say we have a perfect product yet <laughs> and probably probably never uh, never will have i usually say to yeah, to my team and, and others like we will never be worse than what we are today mm. Mm. we're much better today than we were a year ago two years or three years ago and um, Fundamentally, the more, um, yeah, the more components uh, uh, you have in a product, in our case, you both have, uh, yeah, you have the hardware side, you have the connectivity side, so basically yeah, we have the vehicles and then we need to connect them uh, to the network, and then we have the software side with the apps and so on. 
Yeah. How we are uh, running it today is that we have, uh, yeah, we have one person being responsible for the kind of full holistic uh, product experience. Um, mm. And then yeah, yeah, below that person, we have of course, specialized team, uh, teams, one, uh, one team responsible for yeah, the vehicles, one team responsible for IoT, connectivity, embedded firmware, and so on, and other teams responsible for the app experience, the software. In the beginning, that was not the case, of course. Then we were all doing, yeah, we were all, doing all of it. So um, yeah, we were building the product um, um, yeah, on, on our own. Um, my co-founders were responsible both for the hardware and for the software at the same time. Mm. Um, but as we scaled the company, of course, we started to build out uh, more specialized teams and specialized functions. Um, but then I think it's really, really important to have a person or uh, a few people responsible for the full, uh, full product experience. Otherwise, uh, yeah, it's just, just too fragmented. Mm. Mm. Makes sense. Okay. To, to sum it up, um, let's, let's hear, like, tell us how, uh, what Voy will look like in, in five years. And Caro, you start. So um, uh, we've made a pledge that by 2030, we will have replaced one billion car trips. So in five years, I guess half of that. Um, and what I really believe that we will see and what VOI will be is uh, like a crucial part in people's everyday commute. Um, we will see cities with uh, better infrastructure for micromobility. We will have cities that are like actually starting to adapt to um, you know, life with less cars. And um, yeah, I truly believe that we will continue to push our, our vision, uh, cities made for living. So yeah, that's what I think. Wow. And now is the time that I will answer something completely different. Uh, that will be <laughs> spaceships or flying cars or something. No, but, yeah, where we started, as, yeah, where we come from is really that we saw yeah, the shared e-scooters as some kind of entry point into a broader mobility play. And a broader mobility play that goes back to yeah, the problem we saw and still see in cities, that are way too congested, way too polluted. Uh, we think micromobility is one tool to, um, uh, yeah, to mitigate uh, uh, for that. Uh, so it's to continue to build out our micromobility platform, both when it comes to vehicles, when it comes to business models and so on, and integrate it with the broader uh, yeah, urban transportation ecosystem, mm. uh, continue to integrate with public transportation, make it easier for consumers to have a seamless experience. You take, you take a bus, then you take a boy, and then you take a train, or then you take a plane, or something like that. Uh, so just to continue to, um, to build on that platform, um, and as Caroline said, make sure we, um, we've done more than 80 million trips now, uh, then we need to get to a billion trips, then to a billion users, and eventually we will have um, uh, replaced this uh, one billion car trips uh, that we have pledged to do by 2030. Whoa. Okay. We are slowly running out of time. Um, I want to thank you for joining me on this um, last session today on Amphitheater. Um, thank you. Um, thank you, everybody. This was the last session of Amphitheater today uh, on the first day of Slush. I wish everybody has a great evening today and see you again tomorrow. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Santeri.